welcome to the podcast. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here with me. And so for the people that don't know you, and for also including me, because I, I'm not fully aware of Eric, sure. maybe there is, there's some behind the scenes that you can give us a little bit of introduction. So please give us a true introduction, a true introduction of yourself. Sure. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for having me on this podcast. Super excited to be here. My name is Eric Gilmore, and I started a company to help graphic designers speed up their production. I worked in advertising for at least a decade. I worked in a production company. I worked in a DSP, programmatic advertising, and I noticed that there were a lot of challenges around creative production to help graphic designers produce faster. This was a common problem that I saw in the industry because what happens is that when people advertise, they often will create an ad and put all their eggs into one basket and they'll run that ad. But if you run creative variations and different sizes of the ad, you will learn that some of them perform better and some of them perform worse. The challenge there is that it falls on the graphic designer to produce all of these different creative variations. And it's very time consuming to produce all of the little sizes that are basically the same design, but over a bunch of different kinds of dimensions. So I specifically try to focus on this problem to help graphic designers. Great. Can you please share your screen and show us the, the website of your companies so we can get a better visual representation of what you're talking about? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. How long have you been working on it, by the way? Yeah, so I've been in advertising for at least a decade now, and I've been working on this platform for over a year now. I work with graphic designers, I work with marketing agencies, and also in-house brands. And the idea is that they want to get the optimal return on their investment when they advertise. And we have found within the industry that having all of these different sizes, like up here, ba -ba 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 -ba, makes for a more a higher performing campaign. Having just one of these sizes really limits how well a campaign can do. So this is the website. It's called Creative Automatic. And really what it does is it helps to cascade your design changes across other sizes. So I'd be happy hey. to show you quickly here, and you can feel free to edit this out if you would like to. This here is the actual platform, and it's divided between two different sections. One is that it allows the designers to create templates. And you can see here that when you modify things on this stage, that the changes will cascade across all of the other sizes, and you can create templates, and you can very easily populate those templates. So you can see here that as I'm designing, it has all of these different sizes. As I design it, you can see that the changes cascade across all of these. So normally a graphic designer would have to go through and design each of these individually, but you can come in here and you can say, Kyrie's the best. And now you have is all that, of these ads that say across the board. Is, is that a sponsored ad now? Yeah, you know it, buddy. Yeah, so I, I'd be happy to dive into any of those things, but that's just the general idea is to really give back the creative freedom to the designer without having to be bogged down by compression issues or modifying one size to be slightly different than another size. Okay, very interesting. So how long have you been working on this? For about over a year now, I've been working on this platform. Yeah, I have okay. clients that span... As I mentioned before, they're either working in marketing agencies where they're tasked with producing a lot of creative. They might be an in-house brand where they have their own creative team in-house, and they're also tasked with producing a lot of different kinds of creative and also freelance graphic designers. Okay, interesting. So how big is your team right now? Are you a sole entrepreneur? What do you do in your company? Are you the software engineer? Yeah, thank, that's, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much. I am a solo bootstrap founder for Creative Automatic, and I have developed and designed and produced the entire platform. I'm responsible for marketing and sales and customer support and development and bug fixing and all that good stuff. So it's been an amazing journey. I used to work in corporate 
and I had a lot of meetings and it was a lot of time that was wasted. And I saw this as an opportunity to help the graphic designers really produce more and they can charge more. So if you have a graphic designer that let's say charges by output, by each individual size, they would be able to charge for all of these ads that they produced using the tool, standard tools, Canva, Photoshop, Illustrator, you work it one at a time. And I've worked with clients who in the past, they will have produced maybe 12 different ads, but have the wrong text in the ads. And then they're asked to go back and make the changes and it's super time consuming. So this addresses all of those kinds of problems. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So uh, approximately how much month average recurring our annual recurring revenue does your SaaS business make? Yeah, I appreciate that. At this point, I'm not really looking forward to disclosing the financials. We have a handful of clients that are happy using the platform, but with all due respect, I'd like to keep that information closer to the chest. As for right now, I'm just kind of starting up. So it's not as much as I would like to, to live off of, but it's growing. And really the most important thing that I'm focusing on right now is the value that is provided to my partners and the clients. I'm really trying to build a platform that helps my clients make more money and become more successful. And that's really my, this is the first time I'm doing any kind of company founding something. So that's really my number one goal right now. It might not be the right goal, you know, but that's really what I'm trying to do is provide that value so that the companies and partners that I work with are able to thrive. Okay. So with your marketing, what do you do? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm still searching for the best kinds of channels and avenues to find the right partners that would work with Creative Automatic. What I've learned is that, and I'm still very green in the whole process here, so there's a lot to learn. But one thing that I've learned is that the people that I've talked to, they're not all at the same kind of pain point in their timeline. So there are some agencies that are producing manually because they don't have the problem of scale yet. But what I've found is that people that I will show the demo to will think about it. And then I'll hear back from them in four or six months later. And they'll say, I wasn't at that point then, but things have really escalated now. And I've been thinking about your tool. And so they'll reach out and they'll be able to hop back on the platform. And so that, in, that, part of the timeline I've found to be pretty interesting. I've tried a bunch of different kinds of marketing channels. So use Creative Automatic to advertise for Creative Automatic. So I'm able to produce a lot of ads really fast. I mostly use Google Display for the advertising. I've tried Facebook. I've also connected with a lot of people on Reddit and on Twitter. I have not gotten into Quora. I haven't done YouTube videos. I haven't done Stack Overflow or anything like that, but I've found that the best platform for me and also for other kinds of companies is Twitter. I feel that the authentic relationships that you form and the ability to communicate with people who have that same kind of pain point, that has resulted in the most paying clients for Creative Automatic. So really, I'm just trying to focus most of my energy on Twitter because the other platforms, it's it's great to make those connections, but Twitter has been the best for me so far. Okay. I'll be very interested for you to try out producing more content on LinkedIn because okay. there's a lot of marketers there and there's a lot of like small agencies basically who are just freaking hustling. Like yeah. if you go on LinkedIn, it's full of marketing people trying to find like CEOs and companies there. Yeah. So it's full of those people. So I guess if you spend your time, I guess just try it out for two weeks. If you're engaging on Twitter, then spend your time engaging on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and see the difference. Yeah, I, I've seen, you know, a couple of posts go semi-viral on LinkedIn, but they weren't specifically about Creative Automatic. It was more of personal events. I really think that from what I've gathered, producing content is probably one of the best ways to get the clients for really any company. You're establishing your authority in the domain space as a person who knows what they're talking about. 
you're producing content that's searchable by SEO. And then once you have that content available, then you can share it. You can share it on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. And I definitely am going to go down that road this year to produce more content with my subject matter expertise. Yeah, exactly. And I think that if you're the type of guy that just likes writing some quotes on Twitter, then just recording yourself working and screenshotting the tweet that you have, putting it on the video and putting a sound behind it on TikTok, then you can have like the best of both worlds. You can post on platforms where text dominates. You can post on platforms where video dominates, which is TikTok, Reels, YouTube Shorts. So you can expand your reach to even more places because I'm not sure if you have done your research, but Reels, TikTok, and YouTube Shorts, huge organic reach. Yeah, I, I've heard that about also with YouTube that you can create videos that are searchable. So if somebody is looking for something, how do I do this? It'll direct them to your YouTube video. And then you get to see this face or your face, you know, it's, I, I would love to give that a try this year as well. Yeah, I heard this too. And I found someone who has built a company. I found him on Twitter where you install like a Google Chrome extension and it automatically generates for you YouTube transcript where it's captions, but more accurate with commas, with capital letters and this stuff. So it gives you better Google EO and more benefits that I'm not fully into it. And I asked my team about it. I'm like, yeah, it, it helps. This helps. And especially for long form videos. Yeah. I'm like, okay, that's great. Maybe you can try that. Yeah. That extension sounds great. I've seen the Google translate sometimes miss words here and there. So having that extension with the capitalization and the commas and all that sounds like a nice upgrade for sure. And by the way, I'm not sponsored. It's I just feel like, I feel like it's a good product. So I'm like, sure. And I always love entrepreneurs who are building something nice and cool and interesting. There's a lot of Twitter entrepreneurs that are just building useless stuff. In my opinion, I don't know why they're building it. It's like, maybe they're building something. Maybe they're building like a filters app. I'm like, why would you build that? TikTok has that. Instagram has that. Snapchat has it. And what else? I'm like. Are you going to compete with these companies? Good luck. Okay. And if you make money, sure, I'll pay you some more. Yeah, it's really, you know, I, I think it's really tough. I think people are, you know, either working in a job and they have a problem that they want to solve and there's so much to learn. And one of the biggest stumbling blocks is that there's not enough market research done. And so they'll have an idea and they might have the ability to build it. But the idea is just because you can build it, doesn't mean you should. And oftentimes there will be no market research done, no product validation, and they'll go hard into a problem for six months or nine months building something. So what I try to do is, you know, I, I've fallen for a lot of the first time starter problems. I focus a lot of my time for the first year on developing the platform rather than marketing it. But I did go out into the market with some kind of very early MVP. And I met with agencies and I showed them the earliest version of the platform. And at that time, what it did was it automatically generated your ads from the text and the imagery that you provided. So you would say, Kyrie is the best, here's my logo. And then it would design ads for you. The people that I spoke with thought it was cool, but they wanted to have control. They wanted to have design control over the ads, the ability to move stuff around, to tweak it. And I was able to get paid from those early clients to basically change the platform around and make it so that it provides the most amount of value to them. I heard what's working for them and what's not working for them. And starting a business is really hard. And I've tried to really listen to the customers and their pain points and the kinds of problems that they're having and trying to address those specifically. I think that people who start up businesses, they have a lot of, especially if you can develop, you know, you want to build all these cool features, you know, you, you want to build out whatever it is. And it's not always valuable to the end user. I think a, I just thought about this idea. It's not really developed. But I think a something that companies 
SaaS companies, or uh, I'm not sure what other companies can use this, but they can say like in their subscription plans in the first month, say like, hey, pay this amount. And if you don't like it, refund it. And I think in the stage of refund, they, they are more, they can explain why they refund it. And I think that's more valuable than just saying like, hey, one month trial, and then you cancel it with no feedback. So I think this is cool. And I think, I think that annoys me about this SaaS subscription systems that they have mm -hmm. is that pay for a subscription and they don't notify me and they charge me again. I'm like, come on, man, just notify yeah. me. If I'm happy, I wouldn't stop it. If I'm not happy, then yes, I'm going to cancel the other way. Like no need for me to go into the email list because I'm pissed. You charged me without notifying me and say, Hey, like refund me the money. I don't want you to take my money, especially if I'm not happy with the service. And if you charge me without notifying me, so I'm like, notify me, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally get that. I think that I have it set up so that there's maybe like a seven day reminder before the next month has the subscription paid because we do have that. We have a seven day uh, unlimited trial. And then if you want to sign in again, then it asks to start your subscription. You can cancel any time. But I've seen that where, you know, it seems like some companies would rather get the extra money for like one extra month. That's not really how I operate over here. You know, I have, I'm trying to build a strong brand that's built off of authenticity and being reasonable and being just like a normal human being. And so there's really, I'm trying to reduce all of the friction while also trying to reduce anything that might give you a feeling like that, you know, no tricks or anything like that. And I'm not trying to get an extra month out of somebody's payment or anything. You know, it's not, uh, not the kind of business that I personally like to run over here. You know, I like to be honest and provide value for the users. So I think people lately, and this cannot only apply in your niche, but in many other companies' niches and stuff. Oh, cool. Light. I think instead of using just email marketing, we can also use WhatsApp marketing. Like make people have the option of like, hey, do you want to insert your email or phone number? Mm -hmm. And remind them through WhatsApp messages. And if you're a bigger company and like you have higher profit margins, then you can have like normal text because I'm, I'm sure that people are most likely to open the text messages and then their WhatsApp messages and then their email messages. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally agree. A friend of mine works for a company that focuses on those SMS messages for advertising, you know, for marketing purposes. And I think it's great. I mean, I get it all the time and they would say for local restaurants, we have a deal that's coming up and I read it. I read all of them, you know, it comes through and it absolutely works for sure. I think I, I totally agree with you and providing options for the end user, like how would you like to get notified? Do you want the email? Do you want a text message? WhatsApp, you know, providing all of these different options to let the user choose is fantastic. Makes it easier for them. Yeah. And I think a feature that you can add on your app could be uh, maybe the manager of the, maybe you have like an enterprise subscri sub subscription plan. And like, let's say there's a manager and five team members, then each time a team member goes and does something, the manager gets notified on his WhatsApp or his normal text that this member did this. He logged in here, logged out here. So, you know, that would be cool, I think. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny that you should say that because when I first started building Creative Automatic, I had set it up so that it would text myself using SMS messaging whenever there were certain production events that happened in the platform. And how I did that was depending upon whether you have like Verizon or AT&T or whatever, you can actually email the phone number at AT&T, whatever, or the phone number at Verizon, blah, blah, blah. And you end up getting a text message sent to your phone with whatever kind of information you want. The downside that I experienced was that there was a delay and the delay could have been from five seconds to a couple of minutes. Now, everything that I'm trying to do is fast. The website loads fast, the production is fast, the, the email notifications are fast, and I wanted to be notified instantly. What's going on in the server? Who's logged in? Who's having trouble logging in? You know, stuff like that. So what I did was after trying the text messaging alerts, I built a Slack app 
for Creative Automatic. It's very simple. And really what it does is the server will send certain text messages to different channels in Slack. So I have my Slack open. I have a couple of friends that will occasionally help me with different kinds of things. And I have two different channels in my Slack app. One's for notifications, for like emergency alerts if there's a problem. And one is like a server log, basically. And at any time of the day, I can just pull it up and go through and see what has happened. And the, the advantage is there. It's, it's persistent. It stores all of the information so I can scroll up and see what happened. But it's instantaneous. The Slack app, as soon as something happens on the server, pushes it to Slack and I get it on my phone and on the desktop. It's really, really great. It's very basic, but it's really helpful. Yeah, I think if managers use Slack, then that would be amazing. Because I think if you just send them like three to five text messages per day or 10, then over a month, that would, that would be costly. But it depends also on the subscription. Depends which kind of companies use it. And maybe you can add like an option for them to choose other Slack or messages. And if they use the messages, it can be done like, hey, we will charge you this amount for every text notification you get. But if it's a big company, who, what do they care about five cents per text message? What exactly. do they care? Yeah, it's a really, really great way of keeping a pulse on what's happening on the server, you know, or, or you know, in any kind of platform, really. It's, it's been really, really helpful. And it's really my go-to to see, you know, if a new user registers, I get an alert through Slack. If a user requests a password reset or is having trouble logging in, I'll be able to proactively reach out to them and ask them, you know, are you having any trouble? Is there something that I can do to help? So, you know, I really focus on that kind of customer support and service as much as possible. It's really, really important to me. So having this kind of proactive way for me to reach out ahead of time, you know, if they try to log in and they're having issues, they can't remember their password, you know, whatever the problem might be, and then they jump off and they go about their day, they might not reach out to me. You know, going back to what you said before, getting that kind of feedback is really hard. So it's one more way that I'm able to be proactive and be helpful to the client. I love the ideas that come to my mind because now it's just, I, I love business so much. It's just so fascinating to me, this stuff. It's, it's so amazing. So basically another idea that I have right now that just freaking came to my head yeah. is that what if they log in back to their account? I'm guessing you have log yeah, I'm guessing you have login and they you you took them you took them back where they stopped. They're at the exact position of where they were before. Not like at the home tab, not at the settings. Like if they were at the settings, you stay at the settings. If you're mm -hmm. at like your some kind of ad that you're working on, you stay there. Really, really great. Yeah, I, I've heard, I haven't personally used tools, but there are tools like, like Hotjar, you know about this, Hotjar? I think that's the name of it. Basically what it is, is like a little bit of code you put on your website and it records all of the user activity on your site. So you can like see the mouse and you can play back what the user had done. And it really, I think, is used for improving the user experience and the UI. I haven't installed it on my platform, but I think it can be pretty powerful. You know, it shows like heat maps over where the user clicks most often and where they move their mouse and what they're doing on your site. You know, it really shows you as if you're like looking over their shoulder what they're doing after they do it. So it's similar to what you were saying in terms of being able to kind of backtrack. Interesting. I think you can use that not necessarily for fixing something, but getting inspiration to improve something. Yeah, that, that feedback loop is really important. You know, for me, I'm building it, I'm selling it, I'm trying to improve it, I'm trying to provide that value, but I can guess all day long what I think might be valuable, but it's only when the actual users use it and the clients are using it for their work that I get those suggestions and the feedback. You know, I, I use it to advertise for myself, but I use it in one way. And so, for example, we're basically in talks right now to work with another company who, and this is like a cool use case that I never thought of. The original platform was used for design for ads for the internet. But this company that I'm speaking with, they have a platform that goes inside of game engines, goes inside of Unity, goes inside of Unreal, 
So if you're playing a game like GTA or whatever, and you're going through a city, there might be ads in that city that are real ads, and you'll get billed basically by impressions. You'll see an ad inside the video game. Now the catch is that these sizes are different than the size. That's cool. It's really cool. I mean, they're going to use the space for advertising something, but they're finding ways to monetize it so that you don't have splash screens with big ads and stuff. It's more of an immersive experience. The catch is that they have really, really big images that they need for the in-game experience to make sure that the resolution is really crisp. This is something that I never thought of for my particular platform, but I'm working with this company now to add these huge sizes so that they can go inside the game and look really good. And this is something that I never would have found out about had I not had gotten that kind of feedback. So the feedback loop is super important, you know, for what's working, what's not working, new feature requests, any bugs, you know, it's, it's, it's essential. Yeah. For my clients, and I'm not sure if anyone heard this before, but I go, sometimes I go through their comments and I, and I consume their comments because I'm not sure that my clients do that enough. Because I think it's very valuable to see how people react. And a few days ago, one of our clients was not doing well. And my team member thought it was a bug of like YouTube and the VRIQ that we're using. Mm -hmm. So I got into the, into the analytics and I started observing previous months of when we were doing well compared to this month that there was some decreasing growth. Mm -hmm. And it's just observing, like looking at the stats. And I think people's comments are also the stats and mm -hmm. people need to observe more. So yeah, maybe you can consume maybe your competitors. Not sure how you would consume your competitors' comments or emails. I don't think, but I'm not sure how. Yeah, I've read that what you can do is go on to rating sites like G2, and, and other kinds of sites where people will leave reviews of those companies. And what you can do is go through the reviews. I think Andrew Gazdecki from MicroAcquire has said that this is one way to do it, where you can go through the reviews of your competitors and find things that your company does well that people are complaining about on your competitors. And then you use that as a difference. So let's say they don't do certain sizes or they don't provide a certain feature or something, but you do, you can use that as a competitive advantage uh, or you can build that feature and you can use that as a competitive advantage. But yeah, finding think, out those, no, you go. I think in, I'm not sure when, but Jeff Bezos, when another company, when another big company came to be their competitor, not sure at what period. Maybe I'm just going to quote a period right now, maybe in the 1990s or the 2000s. Sure. And a very a way bigger company than Amazon came along. And everyone was scared of like, hey, how are we going to compete them? They're pretty way bigger than us, more carrier to more this, more that. And Jeff Bezos said in the interview that we're just going to focus on the customer experience. We're just yeah. going to focus. We're just going to make customer that the customer is a king. Just yep. to make it as simple, as convenient as just create the best customer experience possible. And I think another piece of advice that Jeff Bezos said, not in that interview, but just another piece of advice that he said was that he tries to inspire his company to think long-term. So even if they suffer long-term, short-term, if they suffer short-term, they will win long-term. So, and they don't care about the profit margins of today. They tried, it, he tries to make them think of the profit margins in the future. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, as a leader, you have to have that, that, that foresight to see what the future is going to be and to kind of pull your company to that place to focus on scaling and what the future is going to bring, I think, is a very, you know, forward-thinking way to go about it. What you had mentioned before about what you said about the customer experience being so important, I think it was yesterday, the day before, I saw a video, early Amazon early Jeff Bezos and somebody went into their office to see what it looked like. It was like pretty dirty and not fancy at all. And they went into his office and they were like, you're using like this put together, like 
it's this wooden desk. It's like, this is not even a desk. Like, what the heck? You're, you're making all this money. You can't even spend on, you know, on a real desk. And he said, we're focusing all of our attention and our money on the customer experience. The desk is a desk. You know, I don't want to spend money there. I'd rather put it into a customer experience. Exactly like you said. And I think not the masses, but the haters of Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, I think they say that, bro, like the, they're all about the money. They care about the money. But I'm like, hold up. Have you seen, have you seen them when they were making bank? Like, can you understand how much money is billions? Can you understand how much money is like a hundred billion? Like some people, I've heard of entrepreneurs selling their company at 30 million and just going, living their life forever. I'm not sure they need a hundred billion to retire, man. I'm sure that they're not in it for the money. They're in it because they love it. And this shows like, because I think an example of Elon Musk showing that he's not in it for the money is that when he, when he had to make a choice, SpaceX or Tesla, when it was like, a, I think, I'm not sure, the 2008 recession and he could only save one company. And he mm -hmm. went with, split the money, going with both. It's crazy, crazy stuff. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure like he can, ch he, he could have chosen any other niche to make more money than what he's building now, which is giving, giving him an even bigger headache than he would like, if he chose something else, maybe. Yeah, and, and these guys that you mentioned are the most forward-thinking people, the futurists of our generation. You know, Elon Musk, his main goal is to bring humanity to a multi-planetary species. He wants to bring humans to Mars, start cultivating Mars, so that if there were to be some kind of catastrophe for our planet, the human race would survive. One of the, that's to me, one of the biggest goals somebody could possibly ever have. You know, it's just, it's almost unbelievable kind of goal like that. I think what you had mentioned before about the people who criticize, I saw a graphic this morning where you had these three signs. The first sign was critics and it had a long row of people behind there lining up. You know, a lot of people have a lot of stuff to say. And the second one were talkers. The second sign were talkers. And it had uh, fewer people, you know, people that talk the talk and want to do something. And then the last sign was doers. These are the people that are actually doing it and doing the hard work. And it was almost empty, you know. And so you'll, I think, often hear a lot of people who, the people who talk and the people who say stuff usually aren't the people that are out there grinding and producing and building and trying to create value. I think this reminds me of a very good example of a lot of people on Twitter. It's just, I don't know, if you see my Twitter replies, I could get sometimes a meme. And first of all, there's three things that people don't understand about me in messages. One, I'm having fun. I'm just chilling. Then people yeah. don't understand my humor. Number two, it's okay. There's like, you miss the micro expressions. You don't know my personality. Number three, I'm just saying what I think is the truth. And I think a lot of people don't know what they're saying on Twitter. It's just a bunch of, it reminds you of a bunch of fake business, marketing, philosophy expert. Yeah, that just, they're just basically 22, 25 years old. And they're trying to build the brand, talking about business, philosophy, and stuff they have never, ever done before. Never read any books. They just get an inspiration from TikTok or some quotes on Pinterest. Yeah. And I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, it, it's really hard. And, and for somebody who, like myself, who's out there, who's trying to start up a business, it's difficult to kind of weed through what to listen to and what not to listen to. Because I have personally experienced people have given me a lot of advice. Do this. Don't do that. Change the UI. Make it more like... Photoshop, you know, all of these different things, but they're not the ideal users for me. They might ha not have the right kind of experience. And so it's, it's a skill that I'm learning, which is how to really read between the lines and see who should you be listening to? What should you be listening to? Take everything with a grain of salt. And I also got to say, I love what you said before about, you know, you put something out there. Sometimes you don't get the reaction you want but that you're just having fun. And that's something that I really love to incorporate into everything that I'm doing, you know, having a meeting with you and doing work and having client meetings. You know, I really like to keep the level at like a super chill, regular human to human. Let's have fun here and see what I can do to help. 
it's kind of my vibe yes i agree with that too it's really this is fun i think it's stressful but at the end of the day it's just fun when you progress i think it's just fun when you have the right people around you and the right team and stuff that's like doing the work properly so if you if you trust your team and you have a good team around you that they like doing the work and they're obsessed with you i think it makes the experience much much better and i Absolutely. think that my team is online and they it's remote work basically 100% of them except the accountant basically that's like not remote but it's just like i told them like i want to open my company like i have a goal by the end of the month i don't know how i'm going to do it but to have 10 active clients so if that happens and i have this, this goal in mind to open to go and re register my business buy an office bring some of my team over here hire them full time and then just have fun it's just more exciting for me to have my team next to me and this yeah. is just so cool yeah it's it's really i completely agree and it's something that i'm also super appreciative of even though i am a solo bootstrap founder i have a support team i have an ai machine learning engineer that i work with I have an advisor who I spoke with this morning and has provided me a tremendous amount of advice and suggestions. I have a senior analyst, an operations guy, and a marketing guy. And they don't work for me full time. They have their full time jobs, but we have regular meetings. They provide support whenever I need it, and it's it's like a family. I mean, it's really we're out there, we're having fun. But this team is really super super smart. They're really professional and. We've worked together for a while, so we have like this very—it's a very deep respect for each other's skill sets. We all work together really well. We don't really overlap too much. Like if we need marketing, we have a marketing guy who's that's his specialty. If we need machine learning or some kind of statistical analysis about something, we have different people on the team that specialize in those kinds of things. But they're all really nice, really down to earth, and we have a lot of fun. So it's—I think it's really important. Yes, it is, and I think one or two weeks ago, I think it's it was one week ago. I told one of my team members, "Hey, man, you're messing up. Okay, if you not if you're gonna continue like this, I'm gonna fire you." He got so he got so confused, and he got he got so confused and kind of like pissed of like why I was gonna fire him. And I think he came from a perspective of like because we I regularly have calls with my team and just talk like not business, no nothing. They're just like I treat them as my friends and family, yeah. and I think he goes like, "Why are you gonna fire me, bro?" Like I'm like I'm your friend, and I he didn't say that in that way, but something like that in, in between those lines. I'm like, bro, I respect you, you're my friend, I care about you, but I cannot let the company go down because you're yeah. messing up. If you care about me, then you're gonna work hard in this company. I'm spending my time and effort and Spending my time and taking their risk to grow this business, and yeah. you're not gonna stay here just because you're my friend and destroy my company. I'm like, although you're working on something and you're making your money and going home and relaxing, I'm here like getting the money that I that I earned, putting it back. So I want some respect, and for you to try your best. And, yeah, yeah. It, it can be, I think, a little bit challenging in the these situations when you have such a great team and they're so friendly that there is that line that. Is kind of drawn, and the reality is that you know while you might be friends, you might have a great relationship. You are trying to establish a business that makes money, and you have to do things in some kind of way to reach that goal. You know, if you want to have a, a group hangout as friends, that's one thing. But if you want to try to build a business, I think that it takes precedence. You know, and you, you have to provide that kind of feedback when it's required. Yeah, I think people need boundaries. I think mm -hmm. people need to know, like, hey, this is business time. Hey, this is relax time. This is friend time. With my with my accountant, they do the work, and then we're done. We chill. We we mm -hmm. we have fun. We do whatever we want to do because it's not business time. Once you do your work, we can do whatever we want. Like, yeah. if you're free, you can just call me, and if I'm free, I can pick up the phone or we talk. But you cannot not do your job properly. Right, I'm paying right. you for a reason. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can see that being a, a challenge there, you know. But you do have to have that line that differentiates 
what you're doing right now. You know, it has to be clear. We're trying to work. We're trying to build something. You know, if you don't want to be a part of it or if you don't want to do the work, we can still obviously be friends. But, you know, you have to prioritize when you're working together to build something. You have to prioritize that work. Yeah. And I feel like over the past few days, I have today, actually, today, I watched a video from Gary Vee and he was talking about hiring people and bringing them part of the team. And then he's like, he, he communicates the vision and if they don't buy it, and if, if they're not part of it, then they're gone. Of course, sometimes he cannot kick everyone out that are not part of the part of the vision and the mission, but he wants people who understand the vision, who are part of it. So I told my recruiter, I told my recruiter today, hey, like find these type of people who are obsessed with YouTube. They're obsessed with making videos. As I am obsessed, I expect the same thing back. Like I expect you to okay, not be obsessed. I'm like work every single day and think about it. Well, you can think about it, but at least love your work and mm-hmm. love it deeply where even though you don't work you you enjoy thinking about how to improve and enjoy what you're doing because yeah. i i like working like it's not even work for me so i want the people who enjoy the same thing who i cannot say hey like bro like go to this because you have to no because you want to do it and that's a massive shift and it's a massive mm-hmm. advantage for people to have yeah having that kind of internal passion is something that I think is hard to teach people. And so if you're able to find somebody who has that passion, who loves to do what they do, and they're also really good at it, that is probably sounds like a much better fit for an organization than somebody who might have a lot of skill, but they're not passionate about it. You know, they don't want to do it, or if they see it as being work. So the good news is that I believe that there are people out there that you're looking for who are really good at it, who love doing it, who are passionate about it, and their visions will align with yours. If you don't have that aligned vision, it might be like dead weight, you know, <laughs> dragging this person along for the ride and you don't want that. You know, really what one thing that I've learned in my life, this is like one of my own kind of visualization techniques that I use. Sometimes in life, there are problems where you want to head in some kind of direction. You don't know what it's going to be, but maybe you love YouTube videos or you love producing content, what it might be. Those kinds of opportunities, I find it's best to think about that you're pushing yourself towards a general field. You don't know where it's going to end up, but you're pushing yourself towards that. Sometimes there are different kinds of challenges where there's a specific goal you're trying to achieve. I want my company to be acquired in five years. I want to get a very specific job. Those kinds of challenges, rather than pushing yourself, I visualize it that I'm getting pulled towards this end result. And when you have this difference between pushing yourself in a general direction versus pulling yourself towards a specific goal, to me, it makes things a lot easier. Because if you have this end goal where you're, push- where you're pulling yourself towards it, it lets you kind of sift through all the BS and all, you know, go through all of the weeds by really focusing on what is super important to get to this end goal. And if you have a team that's aligned on that end goal and you're all getting pulled towards it, you can feel that momentum where people are coming up with ideas to help and they're being proactive and taking it upon themselves to come up with new things that will help reach that goal. That differentiation about pushing versus pulling, I found to be really helpful. Interesting. So what's your goal? Yeah, that's a great question. So my goal is I do not want to necessarily become like a really big company. I don't really want to be a CEO that's in charge of dozens and dozens of people and their livelihood. You know, be boss man. That's not what I'm looking for. I would be very happy building up a successful company with a very small team that provides value to the industry where people are able to exponentially make more money and spend less time with the platform and to either run it at a comfortable rate or for it to be acquired down the road. It's not something that, you know, some CEOs go into business and they want to make a lot, a lot, a lot of money. I don't know if it's counterintuitive, but that's not really what I'm looking for. I'm, I would rather produce a very a platform that really provides a lot of value and make a a living wage off of it and to really focus on 
growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. And that's one of the reasons that I'm trying to stay bootstrapped as long as possible versus accept money from investors. Because I've heard that, I'm sure it's not the case with all investors, but I've heard that once you get in that kind of investment money, it's all about the growth and it's all about more, 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 more. And it kind of goes against my personality a little bit. It might not be the smartest thing to do, but it's where I'm at right now. So here's my point of view on it. When I have clients that I know that they have investors on their side, I know it's not all about what they want. It's about the growth and the profit margins. Mm -hmm. So let's say I have a client that works with us. I know that whatever I say, I think his vision won't really change as much as like a client of mine who just, they just care about why, why, why. And they're not looking to build like brand because they're investors and not necessarily people who are there for the long term. They're here just to get a return on investment. Mm -hmm. That's about it. So unfortunately, I cannot build for them a brand. I got to build for them like a, like a machine, machine mm -hmm. to get their money back and mm -hmm. like sign up, sign up, sign ups, sell this, sell this, sell this. I'm like, sure, but man, like you got to think long term, like I, people are going to just going to, going to be fed up with like seeing you again and again. Or like, let's say, let's say you make like banger videos. Okay. Consistently, which this is our goal with the company to make banger videos and get huge awareness. But every single time there's a call to action of like, hey, the description to buy the thing, buy the thing, buy the thing. At some point, you're gonna get fed up of it. Like enough of you telling me the same thing. It's yes. like, I feel you can resonate with me if like, or anyone else can resonate with me if they're watching YouTube videos and we see again an ad of Grammarly on monday.com. It's like, stop, how many yeah. times you're gonna show me the same ad? Enough. Yeah. And especially if it's the same thing. So, yeah. Yeah, it's really tough. I. I can see, I mean, again, I'm very green in this space. I can see that there are advantages. You can hire people, you have money to invest in certain kinds of things, but having that kind of pressure for sell, sell, sell more, 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 that's not what I signed up for. And one of the beautiful things about starting up my own company is that I get to choose, you know, what direction I want to take. And it might not be successful, but it's something that since day one, I have loved every minute of what I'm doing. I love helping the clients. I love them being successful. And I'm very appreciative that I have the opportunity to bootstrap this versus needing to raise money. Yes, because then it's not even your own. I feel like it's just losing a sense of it. It's like taking one of your arms. It's like I'm being controlled, like having a machine telling you, you kind of have to do this. And it's looking like fully under your control. And it's not like, I think it's the ability to choose. It's not necessarily like you like choosing what to do, but it is the ability to choose if you want to do this. And if you want to do that, instead of like, hey, you got to do this. Like, but I don't want to, but you have to now because I put my money in and you kind of have to. So I think it's just the ability. I think I told my best friend a few weeks ago of like, hey, I think the reason why I want to build my agency to be dependent from me, it's not that I don't want to work, it's that I want to have the ability not to work. And the reason why I want money, it's not to buy stuff, but it's the ability to, if I need to buy stuff, I can yeah. buy stuff. Because I'm not into, Ro I'm not into Rolex, expensive stuff. I, to be honest, I don't really care. But if I want to, then I can have the ability to. And if I want to relax, then I, ha I have the ability to relax. Yeah. It, it, the freedom that it provides, you know, if you have the ability to bootstrap something, I mean, for me, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's really, I get to set up our own team schedule. I get to figure out the kinds of clients. And I have no doubt that there are VCs and investors out there that can provide a tremendous amount of value. I don't doubt that at all. But I have a great advisor and we're trying to build this up from scratch, really. So every day has been a real blessing and I'm really super appreciative of where we're at and the team that we have and the clients that we work with. It's, it's been amazing so far. Yeah, and that like, we can both agree that if someone wait, wants to raise money and because they don't want to spend their own and they're okay with having people telling them what to do and they're okay if like they lose their investors' money and they feel okay with that, then sure. 
but I think me and you, we don't prefer that kind of lifestyle of or building that type of business. I really don't. I, I had a meeting in New York City a couple months ago, and a competitor of mine raised $8 million at a $30 million valuation. And the person that I met with in the city was friends with that person and said, if you wanted to, you could use that company as a comp and you could also raise a good deal of money to hire people to build out what you're doing. And they said, to be honest, the tech that you have under the hood is in some ways already better than what they have. To raise money more than one or $2 million and hire a team to really wrap this up, it's not aligned. <laughs> it's not really aligned with really what I want to do. I'm trying to really build us to be very focused on, as I mentioned before, you know, providing the most amount of value to the partners that we're working with, being able to make those kinds of decisions. I think I, I would not necessarily die, but I don't know, something close to that. If I raised money and like, because I don't know, losing people's money, is just like a big deal for me. But if I lose my money, then no one can tell me anything but myself. It's like, hey, I can do this. And if it fails, it's my money. No one gives a frick. But if it's someone else's money, then I'm stressing out. I'm sweating, man. If I'm making a decision, I'm freaking out of this world. And if I'm raising $8 million, good luck to my sleep. I cannot sleep. But right now, whatever happens in my day, like a business or not business life, I fall asleep very nicely. I can relax my family without thinking about stupid stuff and I can relax. But if I'm raising 8 million, I'm like, oh no, there's no TV, there's no sleeping, there's no nothing. Yeah, it's, it's you know, almost like, you know, you learn to crawl, you learn to walk, you learn how to ride a bike, you know, maybe you skateboard and then you learn how to drive a car and all that. You know, there's like a progression to it where you learn and then you get better and you go faster and you learn, you get better and you go faster. To me, the feeling of starting up a company and raising money is like you are crawling and you learn to walk and then you get thrown into a rocket car. You know, and it just goes really fast, really fast. And different companies and different founders have different goals, but that's not the direction that I want to take at this time. So you're doing this full time? Full time, yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Cool. What else do you do except having a business? So I have two boys, two young kids, and, you know, they take up a lot of my time because every time, all the time that I'm not working, I love spending time with family. I garden. I have a great garden out front and have the garden going right now, get ready to go for this year. And then we live in a great town, you know, go up to the field. We play with the kids, we play soccer and football and all that stuff. So a lot of outdoors and hiking. I like to go backpacking, you know, overnight backpacking, stuff like that. So really a lot of outdoors, a lot of physical moving around and kicking the ball around with the kids and stuff. But that's another thing that I really, really love about being a bootstrap founder is that I get to drop my kids off at school every morning. I get to pick them up every afternoon. I get to hang out with them at the playground. And when they go to their babysitter, then I get to do work. And I get to spend the time with them that I want to, that I would not have had the opportunity if I had a full-time job, you know, at, at like a corporation or something. So the flexibility to spend my time with my family, which is really, for me, what I love to do and spend time with them is such a great advantage. You know, it's just so wonderful. It's, it's really something that I'm super appreciative about. The funniest part, well, it's funny to me, is that I hanged out with my best friend a few weeks ago and I told her, like, we spent such a high price for us to have the ability to see a movie with our family, pick up our kids, like eat nice food, drink nice, like have clean water, have like a shelter above us and just live a freaking normal life. We pay such a high price. Like our ancestors, our ancestors went to war. They had to suffer a lot. We we're still suffering. The, the military of the United States, so like my country and all the countries spend billions or trillions per year to in the military to keep us safe in case of like someone wants to invade us or like huge money to healthcare and like we have all this infrastructure of businesses and are built to make us coffee to serve us food and like crazy how much high price we pay to live just normal life 
Yeah, on on the you know to that point, while we do pay a high price, I feel like a lot of people these days really have a very high quality of life. You know, like you said, like we have a roof over our head. You know, a lot of people have you know indoor plumbing. You know, it's like a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, you had to go to an outhouse outside. So the ability for us to have a refrigerator, have a freezer, have running water inside our house, have a bathroom in our house, have a hot shower in our house. I've always been very, very appreciative of these things because if you were a king 700 years ago, you didn't have any of this stuff. You know, you didn't have the ability to get ice cream out of a freezer or, you know, a lot of the amenities that we have now. So my gratitude and appreciation has been really maxed out for a long time here, really every day grateful. It's funny how we praise the presidents of each country, but their job is literally, well, ideally the job, like if they did everything correctly, the job is to serve us. I mean, you're, you're a member of the society, the simplest person of the society and the whole government's and the whole celebrity's purpose of or actor's purpose is to serve you. So I'm like, I'm not sure if they they should be a fan of you and not you should be a fan of them it's kind of weird it is it is kind of weird you know we have a lot of entertainment you know a lot of movies and sports and it's the idea is really to entertain the people you know it's it's wild so i'm guessing justin bieber for the people who love justin bieber like brad pitt or like president of the united states next time you see them sign a sign their hoodie or something i don't know just mr president can i sign your hoodie yeah, yeah cool. exactly yeah, turn it around, flip it. Yes. That's the interesting way of thinking it, by the way. Yeah, I mean, that that's the reality is that, you know, a lot of the, it's like a public servant in a way, you know, it's like they're out and working on behalf of the community. But I really try to instill, you know, with myself and my kids, that kind of appreciation. So, you know, we pay taxes and those taxes go to the garbage men and the garbage men clean up our garbage. Now... You don't have to, but our boys will go outside and wave to the garbage men and thank them for helping. We really don't, we try not to take anything for granted and to be really appreciative for all of the different kinds of people in our life that help in all different kinds of ways. Okay. I'm not sure if you're educated about this part, but do you know how taxes work in your country? I think so. I mean, as much as I can. Yeah. I mean, like, I think here in Cyprus, over 19,500 you pay like 90%, 90, 19% income tax. How is it in, I'm guessing you're in the United States. Yeah, I'm, I'm in, yeah so the way that the, the taxes work here in the United States, it's engineered this way. The more money you make and the more money you have, the less you pay in taxes. The less money you make, the more you pay in taxes. So for example, if you're a graphic designer in New York, and you make sixty, eighty, a hundred thousand dollars, you will be taxed at a rate of thirty-five percent of your money is going to the government. If you make five million dollars a year and you make that money from selling stocks that you've invested in because you have so much money, you're like, oh, I'll just sell some stocks and live off of that. Long-term capital gains for selling stocks that you've owned for more than one year is only fifteen percent. So if you're very wealthy, you only pay 15% income tax. And if you're poor, not poor, but if you're not super wealthy, you pay a higher percentage of your money in taxes. If you're super, super wealthy, like Jeff Bezos or whatever, you don't have to pay anything in taxes. And so there's a movement in the United States that what this is engineered to do is to make the richer richer and the poorer poorer. And so a lot of people are trying to promote a new movement that is to tax the rich. Because if you were to increase the money, I think in France, they have it so that if you make over whatever, one or $2 million a year, you're taxed 75%. In the United States, if you make a lot of money, you're taxed very little. So people are trying to tax the rich in the States. Mm. So of course, I'm not an expert into this, but I have finished high school and I'm, now I'm in university. I finished high school and basically college. It's, we don't have college in Cyprus, but 
for you guys in the UK is counted also as college. So I finished university and college with by one of my subjects was economics. And I think that taxing the rich less kind of makes sense because I think that they kind of know how to allocate their money better and they know how to provide value. But the thing is, you kind of have to, from the flip side, you kind of have to kind of charge them more by putting them more taxes so you can like help in a way the poor people to, I don't know, use their money in a more effective way and like get them out of poverty. But on the other side, rich people would see this as like unfair because of like, hey, like I'm here working my butt off. I'm risking my money. I'm working like 24 seven. I'm taking like huge risk, like huge risk to invest my money and not like just trade my time. And then you're just here like taxing me. But it's like a huge debate about people who are successful. They were born in a more lucky environment or like with luckier genetics or like with characteristics tricks that are make them like make them more likely to be successful. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. It's a huge debate, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things in the States and a lot of loopholes that allow multi-generational families who have a lot of wealth to keep on accumulating wealth. So every single year, we have more and more billionaires and we have more and more people going into poverty. And the divide is really getting bigger and bigger in that you have a lot more money going to the 1% and a lot less going to the bottom 50%. And the stats are crazy. I think that if you take something like the top 100 wealthiest people in the United States, they would have more wealth than the bottom 50% combined. You know, it's it, maybe even more than that. You know, there's, it's just a tremendous amount of wealth that is accumulating into just a few things. You know, you have Elon Musk and Bezos, you have the Walmart family, the Waldens, you know, you have these families that have multi-generational billions and billions of dollars, and they just keep getting richer and richer and richer. You know, like you had mentioned earlier, it's almost impossible to be able to visualize how big a billion dollars is. And these companies, you know, like, you know, they, they through investing, they're able to make a tremendous amount and they're not taxed on it. So it makes it really hard when you have people who are like graphic designers who are working eight, 10 hours a day trying to make money. And then they're being taxed a lot. You know, it really takes a bite out of their productivity, I think. Yeah. I was thinking while you were speaking, oh, that's wrong, okay, of like the rich spend it in ways that can benefit the economy of like increasing the, the capital goods and increasing the product, productive capacity of the economy. And I'm like, okay, where do the poor people spend poor? income low income level people yeah. spend it and i think poor is not like an insult or anything what where do they spend it i'm like hmm spend it on like food spend it on like rent which is also helping other businesses so i'm guessing it's kind of the same thing but i'm like i don't know is it the same thing is not yeah i i personally have not seen that kind of trickle down economics work so I'm not seeing somebody like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk spending a billion dollar buying goods and services. You know, I'm seeing him reinvesting it into his company. You know, I'm not really seeing that kind of trickle down economics. And, you know, I think that people who don't have a lot of money, they put a lot of their money into rent. And then people who do have money, they will buy property. And there are a lot of loop tax loopholes when you're a real estate owner. So if you own real estate, let's say you buy a house for $100,000 and somebody lives there and you're charging them rent and you're making money and you're paying off the mortgage and you're increasing the equity in the house. And then let's say you sell that for $140,000 and you use that to buy a bigger house. If you know the tax loopholes, there's something that's called like a 1031 exchange, which means that if you use the money from one sale to buy a property, a different property, you do not have to pay taxes on that first property's sale until you sell this final property. And what people will do is they will continuously buy properties their whole life, upgrading, upgrading, and upgrading, never having to pay taxes on those properties. And it's really about the more you know, the more about these tax loopholes and ways to make money, the more you're able to kind of play the system, you know, play the game. 
And it's, it's really hard because when you're making $1,200 or whatever it is, and then 800 of that is going to rent, that's money that goes away every month. You know, you're not building equity with that. So I think it's really hard. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think a lot of these successful people and success, I mean, in, the, in this conversation, it just means like people that make a lot of money. They weren't, well, I think a huge majority of them, they weren't born with a lot of money and they basically self-made people like that. And I kind of think like, hey, if Jeff Bezos is spending his money to employ more people, or like invest into making people more productive and spending into having internet all over the world, like Neural Neuralink, I don't know how you call that, or like taking us to space. I'm like, for me, which I'm middle income person, I'm like, sure, take it. Why? Because I think that the government, a lot of it, it's just corruption. So why, why am I supposed to, why are you supposed to take my taxes and spend it and not spend it, you consume it instead of like going to public services, hospitals, new roads and stuff. I'm like, I want to spend my money into Amazon. Like you take it where you deserve it and make it however you want it. But if like, if the government was not corrupted and it was going to the right places, I'm like, sure. I want to spend tax. I want to give my money to taxes because it's going to a good place. But if I'm, I'm if, if I'm hearing all day long, I'm complaining of like corruption and like basically our our freaking politicians making millions, millions per year through yeah. corruption. I'm like, nope, you're never gonna get my money. Yeah, I used to work for a company that made their money through government contracts for the United States government, and how company I worked for made their money was that they had employees and those employees would work hourly. And then at the end of the week, they would say, how many hours did all of our employees work? And then they would charge the government. Now, if you worked fast and you got your work done quickly in less time, my company, you know, the company that I worked for would only be able to charge the government less money because it was not you didn't spend as much time, you know, you did the work fast. So, you know, like I said, I have a fast site. I have, you know, produced a creative fast, email fast, Slack fast. I'm all about that speed, you know? So I was working at this company and I'm doing it fast. You know, I'm building out the stuff fast. It looks good, happy, and everyone's good to go. And my boss comes over and he said, slow down. You're doing it too fast. If you do it too fast, we're not going to be able to charge the full amount for this contract. We allotted 40 hours for the contract. So you got to spend 40 hours on the contract. I said, I already did it in 15 hours. We're done. It looks good, man. Like, let's move on to the next one. They do not charge on a per project basis. The government charges on a per hourly rate. The problem there is that I was told to slow down, to waste my time so that they could make more money. This is an inherent difference in my mindset, which is I don't want to do that. I don't want to waste time. To me, Time is the most valuable commodity we have. You don't know how much time you're going to have on the planet. I like to do work fast. I like to do it well. And when that happened at work, I said, this is not the place for me. And I left my job without having another job lined up. I quit because it didn't really align with the kind of person I am. And then I ended up getting a job in advertising, which kind of kicked off this whole direction. And, you know, it it made a big difference. You know, I'm not the kind of person that, wants to go to work for eight hours a day and just sit there and dilly dally and exchange my time for money. You know, it's not me. I agree. I'm the same way, by the way. And hopefully, hopefully, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to hope for, but let's say in three to four years from now, I mean, uh, I become an accountant because I'm studying accounting and finance. Hopefully I'm not depressed working at it. But again, I, I don't know what I'm hoping for. I just hope for the best. I don't want my, my, my will to get in the way of God's will because I'm not as wise as God if people believe in God. And I was to say, I was so depressed when I was in the army because here we're required to go to the army. And I wasn't depressed because I'm go- I was going to the army. I was depressed because our government is so corrupted and they don't spend money on equipment, on like bullets so we can do the proper training and stuff. So I'm like, hold up a minute. I'm going to the army for my country. And we're not doing any military exercises to protect our country. I know that Cyprus is never going to attack anyone because what the frick, 
eight hundred one million one million people population you're gonna attack someone no you're gonna just gonna dive protecting yourself okay and you're just gonna waste my time giving me peanuts money like very little money and just giving me food that is nothing and surrounding me with toxic people because a lot of people in the army are toxic i'm like you're just wasting my time and that's the worst thing ever but i kind of i kind of have to do this so i can get like to show to show people maybe the university i'm gonna go to or like the job i'm gonna go to not like i have this piece of paper and i'm not crazy because if you if you're gonna leave from the army you're gonna have to get t- you're gonna have to go to a psychologist and prove to him that you're crazy and mentally incapable and yeah it's really not fair you know especially when you're asked to put your life on the line and you're being asked to fight and to do all of these things which might be outside your comfort zone you know if you're gonna move towards that you know there needs to be reciprocation you need to have the training and the support it's like if i'm going to help you you got to help me you know and it sounded it sounds to me like that was sadly only like a one-sided experience for you so i'm sorry to hear that it is what it is yeah. Uh, yeah i think it wasn't i think it's not as sad as i made it seem and sure. i don't i don't see I don't, I don't i'm not crying just the lighting by the way so yeah i don't know people think, see, that, see that i'm crying oh, no no looks not. good man looks okay. good 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 so yeah by the way you told me at the 30 minute mark they're gonna have to go but i don't know what happened there yeah l- let's uh, let's wrap it up in five minutes so i can hop onto this call at 11. okay if, if, that, if that works for you yeah of course so any last words so you make it on time you prepare on time and everything any last words to the audience? Uh, just, you know, if you made it this far, thank you so much for your time. I hope that we provided value to you. If you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out. My email is eric at creativeautomatic.com. It doesn't have to be about work stuff. It could be about whatever. And Kyrie, thank you so much for having me on this awesome podcast. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And I look forward to doing it again sometime. I don't know if you are going to do this every year or something, but I would love to keep in touch with you and, you know, follow along your progress as well. Great. Thank you for coming. Take care, guys.